Welcome to A Growing Concern. Before we get going on tonight's topic, which will be genetic engineering, I just want to say woohoo for the uh, fluoride vote that just came on last uh, Tuesday. Uh, I was quite surprised that it, that it finished the way it did. I expected uh, that it would be turned down, but I didn't expect it to be a three to two. And so uh, a lot of good work was done with a lot of people. I want to thank Clean Water Portland. And I like to think that quite possibly the community media had a lot to do with that in this town because uh, it was being covered by KBU, various cable access programs. And a lot of people thought it was very important to stop this. Even if it's only temporary and we need to go on from here to another battle, uh, that battle was won and uh, everybody worked really hard for that. And I really want to thank everybody that was involved in it. But tonight we're going to move on to genetic engineering. It's a large subject. We're going to probably uh, drill down on a, on a few points within that large theme. Uh, we have as our guest Mark Desmaret from uh, uh, Resistance Against Genetic Engineering. And uh, Tiffany Ayers, is that right, Ayers? Yes. And she's the one, the lead organizer for the March Against Monsanto. And we'll talk about that through the through the evening as well, and uh, let folks know what's going on with that. It's it's a rally that in March it's going on tomorrow. That'd be the 25th. So first we'll talk with Mark and find out a little bit about resistance against genetic engineering. I understand there's a resistance against genetic engineering in the East Coast too as well. Yeah, though they've, they've, they've kind of changed their name um, and kind of stopped using that name. We're, we're basically the last uh, rage, the last resistance against genetic engineering. And uh, we've never been paid. <laughs> we do it from love and heart and, and uh, the need to you know, do this kind of work to, to try and stop these companies from destroying the planet and destroying biodiversity and, and stealing our food and, and making it so that we can't even grow you know, open heirloom varieties of food and, and sustain ourselves. Mm -hmm. but, uh, you've been, uh, the Northwest Resistance Against Genetic Engineering has been, what, 10 years now, something like well, that? Well, we started in 1999, the spring of 99, so we've been around for a while. And, uh, you know, we've done a bunch of really good things. We got uh, Trader Joe's to go 100% GE free. And, and they've continued that. Yeah, too, and I believe. it's the only grocery store chain in the U.S. to this day to go 100% GE free. Uh, I didn't know that. Yeah, Sorry. It, it's, they're great. And then, you know, recently Whole Foods came out with a proposal by 2018 to make mm -hmm. all of their suppliers, if they use GE ingredients, to label. And it's a good thing, except that uh, Whole Foods could actually make their suppliers do that in like three months. Mm -hmm. So the, the owner of the CEO of Whole Foods, he, he plays a game and he was forced basically by the Organic Consumers Association and, their, and the people who shop at Whole Foods to finally do some funding for Prop 37, the labeling initiative in, in California that did fail. Um, but if he hadn't had this pressure, he wouldn't even have funded that. Like they promote their organic brands and they promote, uh, you know, GE free stuff, but they have tons of genetically engineered ingredients in the food in their stores. So it's interesting that they're now forcing their, la their uh, suppliers by 2018, which is five years from now, mm -hmm. to either get rid of them or to label them. Well, that brings up a really good point in my mind that, that, that this is genetic engineering, GMO, never, never land here in the United States. Yeah. But in other countries, belly of the beast, yeah. in the other countries, it's not that way at all. No. Most of the rest of the world doesn't, uh, doesn't either allow it or they require labeling. And when it's labeled, people don't buy it. So they actually don't really have, have much of it on the shelves. And uh, more and more countries are banning it outright. Hungary mm. just burned. Their government just burned a thousand hectares of GE corn. Was it Monsanto's? Yes. Yeah. Wouldn't I love to see that happen <laughs> in America? <laughs> that would be one big mm. fire because there's a hundred million acres of, uh, well, about 90 million acres of GE corn, much less all the soybeans and the sugar beets and all the other stuff. That'd be a huge conflagration, which I would, I would dance around. Mm -hmm. Yeah, might be a little bit <laughs> too much pollution there, but it'd be, well, there's that well, factor, we'd be put right? up with it. So, <laughs> and uh, so, so uh, Tiffany, what uh, I know you're the lead organizer. What has it been? Something you've been working on for a while, or been concerned about, or what brought you into the to this uh, lead organizing for the Monsanto March, which is international and international. International, yeah, it's in over 49 countries. Um, what I, I mean, I've been concerned about GMOs for a long time, and. Uh, 
basically just voicing my opinion through social media and trying to make people aware. And then um, Obama signed the H.R. 933, which was the resolution to keep the government funded, which inside of that was Article or Section 735, um, which was the Monsanto Protection Act. And I was pretty furious about that and sitting on my porch wondering, what can I do about this? And oddly enough, three hours later, I got my answer and I'm organizing the March mm -hmm. Against Monsanto. So that's what ticked you off then, as well as A should. lot of things have ticked me <laughs> off. <laughs> uh, it just happened is, that... It all came together. It yeah. all came together, right? Yeah. Right timing. Well, you know, you mentioned that in case the, the viewers aren't familiar with that, the, the Monsanto Protection Act was, like you say, it was stuffed into a bill and a lot of them probably didn't even know about it, right. which just brings up a whole issue of, you know, why are they why are they voting on things they don't know about? But at the same time, it, it is it is a uh, a protection against Monsanto that states cannot sue them. Was that what it was? Something like it's that? It's that the, uh, the USDA is basically made to go ahead and let farmers plant genetically modified crops regardless of whether they have cases against them for various issues like health assessment risks or or any any kind of case they're allowed to go ahead and plant them regardless so they're they're above the law basically now mm -hmm. and so the farmers don't don't have any say in any of this then well not organic farmers i mean the, this is, I think, oh, how do I put that? People that are planting genetically modified crops are, are allowed to go ahead and plant them whether or not it's deemed safe. Whether it'll invade. Whether it's an invasive species, whether it's an environmental risk, anything like that. Mm -hmm. I know a lot of people uh, like yourself were really outraged at this. It was just all over the internet and I think there's been a move to, to uh, rescind that. Do you, you have any information about it? Yeah, actually, Senator Merkley is uh, working because not a, it, it, the the HR nine thirty three is only good till October. It was a oh, a okay. six month bill to to fund the government and keep the government from shutting down. Uh. But after that, there's the Farm Provision Act, which this they're trying to sneak this Monsanto Protection Act into that too. And Senator Merkley is actually working to overturn that and he actually has a petition going online and is acting or asking for funding because he's like I I'm gonna need help mm -hmm. doing this this is a big thing to take on right you know I, I got a couple websites earlier off this I got the uh, www.fooddemocracy.org fooddemocracynow.org yes they're a good organization and, and foodfirst.org and I think the Monsanto Protection Action on Food Democracy Now, I think when I wrote it up, I forgot to put the now in there. But fooddemocracynow.org, if folks want to get out there and go to the this website and you want to register or uh, put in your your uh, your voice on this against the Monsanto Protection Act, that that would be a place to do it. But if you're if you're adept at Google, you'll be able to. Yeah, they need to put a now after democracy there. So food democracy now. And if you want to, if you want to weigh in on that, there's a lot of ways to do it, but that'd be one way to do it. And uh, so we'll, we can get back a little bit to that that rally, you know, as we go through the program. But the, originally, I got on, I got got with Mark, because we both share on the on uh, the board on Bark. And at one of the meetings we were talking about, and I was asking him about these um, Franken salmon, which which has I've been getting emails and and uh, seeing things on e uh, Facebook a lot about it, and I was curious about it, and I got digging around and found out this battle's been going on for years. 2010, there was like 30 different organizations that came out against this, so this is something that's been going on for some time, and 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 uh, it just seems to me that. Uh, it's bad enough that we have hatchery fish, but hatchery fish and franken salmon are not the same thing. I take it. No. <laughs> <laughs> so they engineered a, uh, a wild Atlantic salmon with a couple different genes from some other fish. One was a Pacific yeah. salmon and an eel pout, and one of the genes that they inserted is a cold tolerance gene, and the other one is a growth hormone, a growth promoter gene. So salmon really only grow about six months of the year. 
And so with these added genes, the fish are going to be cold tolerant, which actually allows them to grow during winter when they normally slow down their metabolism. And then the other um, growth or the hormone promoter enhancer allows them to grow. And the idea is that in 18 months, they'll be able to grow a salmon to the same size as a four-year-old normal salmon. And they call it the Aqua Advantage Salmon. And it comes from a company out of Prince Edward Island up in Canada called Aqua Bounty. Jim Stoddish is the, uh, the CEO of that. And this has been going on for 12 years. So they have, uh, they have a facility up there. They grew these fish. And then they've been, you know, they've done all these studies and they've been applying um, to get deregulated status. Basically deregulated means being able to go out and commercially sell it or produce it and, and put it on the market. Uh, for years, and we've we've been having uh, lawsuits against them. We've been having labeling bills. Alaska um, just uh, uh, brought up a labeling bill to label GE salmon. They've also brought up uh, Begich and Lisa Murkowski a bill in Congress to actually ban GE fish entirely. Years and years and years ago, Oregon banned the uh, growing of GE salmon in the state in state waters. And so this issue has been going on forever, and it will be the first uh, GE animal produced for food, con for consumption, mm -hmm. if it actually passes. And it's now in kind of the final stages where the, EP or the FDA came out and they said, well, we're now in the final stages of, of approving this. And uh, Aqua Bounty, which has been losing money for the last 12 years because they haven't actually gotten this product onto the market, and they have all these angel investors who keep investing millions and millions of more dollars to, to keep them afloat. Um, so they're in the final stages, and you know, thousands and thousands of people, there's been a petition with over a million people who've said, no, we don't want this. Thousands of comments when they had the comment period for the environmental assessment, for the comment period when they first came out with the idea to deregulate, and now um, you know the Ocean Conservancy, Center for Food Safety, Organic Consumer Association, on and on and on, all these organizations, and especially Alaska. The Alaska senators, Republican and Democrat, are completely against this because they know that if this genetically engineered salmon gets out into the wild water, into the waters, it will decimate our already impacted and severely declined uh, wild salmon Through species. interbreeding? Through interbreeding. They've, they've done these studies where 60 of these fish, if they were to get out into the, the open water, could within uh, 40 generations, basically about 40 years, would make the wild Atlantic salmon extinct. So the company says, well, we're only producing sterile female fish. Mm -hmm. And that's how the FDA is actually regulating this. Oh, they're all going to be sterile, so no big deal. However, sterility um, function doesn't work all the time. And even in the Aqua Bounty's documents, 95% of the time it works. And we are talking about millions, tens of millions yeah, 5 of fish. Of so 5% of, yeah. of tens of millions <laughs> is. And, you know, they also say that... Um, because they're having they're been having such a regulatory hurdle to to cross in America, they're going to grow the eggs in Prince Edward Island in, in uh, Canada, ship them to Panama on an inland uh, facility to raise those eggs in the smolts or olivine, and then from there and, and then actually to raise those all the way to adulthood, and then ship that dead fish that meat that product to America. So that's what they say publicly. However, we have uncovered documents that they have uh, pre-orders from around the world for eggs and including companies in America who want to grow eggs. So their strategy or their theory is, let's get it approved with this two facility thing. One, they're going to produce eggs in Prince Edward Island. They'll ship those to Panama. It'll be inland. There's no way it could possibly get into the waters down there. And then once that is uh, approved, deregulated, all bets are off. Then they will start shipping eggs and olivine to uh, companies all over the world. And how do they grow fish? How do they grow um, farmed salmon? They grow them in open nets in the ocean. And every single year, at least two million of these fish escape. The storm comes along, breaks the net, all these fish escape. And these are basically superior fish. They're going to be bigger, 
female uh, wild salmon are going to want to mate with a, a larger male fish. And uh, in the female salmon that would get released in these uh, escapes uh, can outcompete because they grow all year long. Just simply from size? Simply from size and simply from the fact that they uh, can eat all year long and will get bigger and will outcompete the native fish. So their idea, um, I mean it's a smart strategy on their part, but we are going to win. Um, if the FDA actually does approve it, uh, there'll be a lawsuit, of course, and we've already had a couple lawsuits. Uh, they're now in the environmental impact statement process, so they, we've required them or forced them to do an environmental impact statement. However, that statement is limited because they're only looking at these two inland facilities. Mm -hmm. Even though anybody who's ever read anything from the Aquabounty website or you know their press releases, whatnot, they know that this company is going to do that to start with, those two facilities, and then ship them all over the world once they get deregulated status. Right. So, is, so they're doing the in, in, environmental impact statement, so they have already taken public testimony? Yeah. The testimony was over on April 29th. So it doesn't, people can't weigh in on this? Not anymore. Right. But there will be a lawsuit if the FDA approves it. And the other crazy thing about this is because the... <laughs> the regulatory agencies really didn't know what to do with this GE. It's an, it's an animal, and it's going to be for food. Um, there are GE goats out there. There's a bunch of other genetically engineered animals, um, but they're more for medicinal purposes, like the GE goat produces a, a hormone in its milk that um, can help, um, you know, diarrhea and other, other issues. So they're going to make, uh, you know, medicine out of that stuff. But with this case, it's a food, and, of course, it won't be labeled. Um, unless we actually get labeling legislation. And the FDA has decided to regulate it as a new animal drug under a veterinary process. As opposed to actually calling it a food, they're actually going to call this salmon a new animal drug, which actually has a little bit less uh, regulation, even though this whole system of genetic <laughs> engineering has very little regulation to begin with. Yeah, right. All of this stuff <laughs> is on the market. And for one, that's illegal. That process that they've decided to go through is illegal. They cannot and should not. Who has decided to go through it? The FDA. The FDA. Because okay. they were just confused what to do with this, you know, this GE animal, and they decided to regulate it or look at, you know, look through the regulatory process as a drug. Well, who does the deregulation for that? Like with the USDA and the GMO plants, it's APHIS. That does right. the, the risk assessment, but who does it for the fish? Well, in this case, it's F FDA and APHIS. Oh, APHIS does that as well? Yeah, but they've decided to look at it as an animal drug as opposed to actually food, which is what well, it is. So that's a lawsuit right there then. Right. Yeah, I mean, the company has uh, been, you know, really sore for the last 12 years because we've been <laughs> fighting them tooth and nail every single way mm -hmm. or every single step. And, you know, we're not necessarily one yet, but, you know, we will at some point. And it's cost them tons and tons of money. These people have burned through hundreds of millions of dollars, which is why they just got a $6 million infusion from an angel investor to keep them afloat. Because um, they, they were losing tons of uh, millions of dollars every year because their product hadn't been on the market yet. They weren't actually making any income. They should have spent some of that money up front to see if it was how people would react to it first. Well, but yes. I guess that would be too, too <laughs> well, reasonable. Well, now they know the reaction. Millions <laughs> of people have commented, we don't want it. Mm -hmm. S the whole state senate in Alaska doesn't want it. Oregon has already banned the production of it in the state. All sorts of other um, senators and legislators are against it as well, as well as numerous other countries around the world. Mm -hmm. yeah. well, well, Tiffany, were you, were you aware? You seemed like you were aware of all this already. I was definitely aware of, of the salmon and aqua bounty. I obviously don't have as much information or knowledge about that, so I'm actually being enlightened mm -hmm. a little bit here today. I definitely didn't know APHIS was the same regulatory agency regarding yeah. that. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, you said that the, the, the Monsanto, uh, was it the Protection Act or whatever that was, kind of tipped it for you. Well, what was, I mean, maybe one of your other pet peeves with Monsanto along? Because there's just so many to talk about from seeds to, to well, uh, intellectual I, property. I mean, it goes on. They've been poisoning us for years. I mean, mm -hmm. they're a chemical company disguised as an agricultural company. And 
basically they're patenting life so that they can peddle their chemicals. Uh, they, they, they started out in 1891 in St. Louis, Missouri. Um, they were responsible for the trigger for the atom bomb. Um, Charles Allen Thomas was a scientist that actually discovered that in the Dayton Project, which was linked to the Manhattan Project. Um, they are also responsible for DDT, which was supposed to be good for me, and they sprayed it on children. Mm -hmm. you know? And just about killed our national bird. Yeah. The national emblem, I should say. They are responsible for uh, Agent Orange. I mean, them and Dow Chemical, actually, together, um, who both are actually working on uh, a new thing because glyphosate, the Roundup, the Roundup isn't right. working anymore. So Dow and Monsanto are, are coming together. And 2,4-D, which was half of Agent Orange, is, um, or Dow's half. Monsanto had 2,4-5-T. But they're going to mix the 2,4-D with the glyphosate with this Colex D technology, which is a proprietary blend, so nobody really knows what it is, and that's that's waiting uh, deregulation right now. Mm -hmm. So I mean, sorry, I'm nervous. I don't talk on TV much. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, you, you know, you're passionate about this, so there's a, you know, there's a lot a lot of feeling that comes through this when you talk, and and, and I'm sure the viewers can can see that. And uh, like Marcus said, that this this has been uh, pretty much open market for genetic engineering and it's because of Monsanto and what are some of the others? There's Dow, Sagenta, Bayer. BASF. Pfizer. Yeah. Is uh, no, not Pfizer's Pfizer. drug but they're all related. I mean it, they all start from oil companies and then there's divisions off of these oil companies whether they're agrochemical or just chemical or uh, pharmaceutical. They they all stem from one mother. Why is business. it they, they, they stem from petroleum? Yeah, they do. Yeah, they, they, they all they're stem all from petroleum. They're all made from petroleum. Then. Yes. The organophosphates or whatever these are these are called. Yeah, that's true. And I know that the uh, two four five T was banned. From what I remember, it was the it was the uh, two four D would kill the uh, deciduous. And the 245T would, would be killing uh, like evergreen trees and things. And why they took one off the market, not the other, yeah. you know, I never did understand that. Well, they both have byproducts of dioxin, right. which is known carcinogen. One, I mean, 245T was uh, deemed as, as a higher risk for the dioxin, but 24D also actually produces that as well. So does glyphosate. You mean it produces it when they're making it, or it it's or it breaks down? Breakdowns, it. it breaks down. Yeah. Uh, that's and you remember, Jim, in years past when I've been on your show, basically we were just talking about Roundup resistance uh, prop products or crops, and now we are going to start talking about dicamba. It's another toxic herbicide. 2,4-D resistant crops. They're now because glyphosate is failing, and the whole genetic you know system is failing because plants are becoming resistant, so we have all these weeds, we have 20 different species of weeds that are now resistant to Roundup, uh, the insects are becoming resistant to it, blah, blah, blah. So now they're moving into even more toxic chemicals that they're inserting into these plants to be resistant. And they call it stacking. Yeah. It's more like keeping digging is what it <laughs> it's more. Well, you right. create a problem, you create it, and they just keep, it's a circular cycle of, quote, fixing what they've already mm -hmm. broken. And 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 it isn't it isn't uh, you know before I moved on to, from that the uh, the situation with uh, like tuberculosis and strains of gonorrhea and these other things has happened the same thing these these bacteria whatever they are are uh, becoming completely inured to to those to the uh, penicillin pretty soon we're not going to have anything that works there and I don't know where they're going to go from there yeah. but from what you're saying here all all the uh, uh, the dicamba, which is in which is which is in the weed, be gone. That they buy at Freddy's or whatever. Uh, that that stuff is going to uh, is, is is not going to be working. So they're going to have to make something stronger. We already have how many chemicals? Eighty-five thousand chemicals or something yeah. like that. You have the figures on that. Uh, it's top something like that. It it's, could be even higher. Yeah. yeah well, I, th I think <coughs> it was Anderson, Anderson Cooper that had his blood or whatever checked, and the, yeah. They had how many hundreds or thousands of chemicals did they find in his body? I mean, it, it, it woke him up. Yeah. 
and that's a lot of that is because of the the, the petrochemicals and and the and the, the different organizations or corporations that you mentioned. It uh, it's pretty scary, and it's it, it's like I said, they're just going to keep digging. There's so many ways to go from here. I mean, it, uh, I know one of the things I wanted to talk a little bit about is uh, there was I saw something on TV, and I was already aware of this, but I saw something on TV that they did a really good coverage of of the of the uh, the suicides in India having to do with, actually it was, it was Monsanto, and they even had a Monsanto representative there denying that any of this was happening. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, that's from the BT Cotton. Right, can you talk a little bit about that, since you seem, you know, you're aware a little <laughs> bit of it. Don't yeah. even put you on the spot. <laughs> no, it's okay. Um, yeah, it's uh, the BT Cotton, which is Monsanto, and, and it's a st systemic pesticide. So basically it, it comes from the seed and grows throughout the plant. And the cotton is supposed to be resistant to the boll weevil or the boll worm, and it's not. They, there's superbugs, and they're they're destroying people's crops. And so these farmers are having to buy more pesticides and more pesticides, and it's not working. And they're getting so in debt that the statistics on this is that every 30 minutes, an Indian farmer is committing suicide. That's how many of them are actually killing themselves because they can't afford this mm-hmm and so what it is is that the this uh what is it thuringia or something like that bt bacillus thuringiensis. yeah thing. it's it's inserted in, in, in genetically inside the uh, the corn mm -hmm. and then it it uh it supposedly has this killing properties that things that eat it as the corn plant grows not corn it's actually cotton. cotton but it's the same thing with corn too in, in they, this case they yeah, do with, with the corn I, that's yeah. the one i was more familiar with and and so they not only have to to uh, if, they, if these crops fail they also have to buy the seeds again too mm -hmm. and this goes on year after year and if i understand it correctly you're saying that after they get piled up so much debt that the indian farmers uh, over there uh, commit suicide yeah what happens to their family well I the interesting know. thing about <laughs> india's uh laws is that the man holds the debt because he went to the money changer or the money lender and, and took out a loan to buy this expensive seed and to buy this expensive herbicide and then the crop fails because the bullworm is resistant to it at this point and and the, the cotton actually doesn't grow that well there anyway the, the, the variety that they've introduced and the interesting thing about Indian law is that when the, the farmer kills himself he also kills his debt so that is a main reason, or one of the main reasons why these men, they don't obviously feel good, right? So they're killing they're the debt. Killing themselves, what? but they're also not leaving their family ah. with this crushing debt. And in Indian culture, if you don't have a husband and you've just become divorced, like you can't remarry them. I mean, there's you know, a lot of cultural problems that happen when these, these men kill themselves. So these women um, may not get to keep the land, you know? and all these other aspects to it. So it's this horrible um, epidemic. Mm -hmm. And it's literally caused by Monsanto introducing, forcing into the Indian uh, agricultural system these BT cotton um, varieties that aren't working. Mm -hmm. And of course, <laughs> you ask any entomologist, when you create Roundup Ready corn or BT corn or BT cotton, um, you have that pesticide in that plant, in every single cell of that plant, 365, well, however long the crop, crop cycle is, 24 hours a day, some insects just aren't going to die because they're naturally resistant. Well, all they the just other get a little bit of it. Right. All the other ones will die. Well, the ones that reproduce are the ones that are resistant. So Monsanto is actually creating resistant insects. Mm -hmm. And of course, BT is a great product that organic farmers get to use. So not only are, is Monsanto destroying um, agricultural opportunities for those who don't want to go organic, but for organic farmers who don't want to use these toxic pesticides, they can legally use BT on their crops, but they are now unable to do that because these insects are resistant. So you're saying that organic farmers can use the BT? Yeah, I yeah, didn't it, know about it's, that. It's, I didn't it, either. Yeah, it's actually, I mean, it's, it's a common soil <laughs> bacterium. And they just um, and gather it up, and, and you can use it. Um, it's it's a non. Uh, it's not nearly 
the, the BT is not nearly as lethal as like a glyphosate. It doesn't, you know, mess up the water and all that kind of stuff. It's very targeted, actually. And that's the difference also with either conventional farmers or with organic farmers. We spray BT when we need it. So we have an infestation of bugs, and then we spray it. With the, with the BT crops, that pesticide is out there 24 hours a day. And so when we spray when we need it, once or twice a year maybe, or maybe not at all, those insects don't become resistant to it. Well, isn't, BT is a neonic, isn't it? No. No? Mm -hmm. Okay. What's mm -hmm. neonic? They're, <laughs> they're like a, a, a nicotine-based pesticide, and I believe that um, Bayer actually has uh, gaucho and poncho, and which are, they're believed to, um, they're systemic pesticides as well. They grow throughout the plant, and they are been attributed to the colony collapse disorder and in France, oh. they actually banned them. You saw that, yeah. Yeah, and um, after a year of banning them, they've actually seen an increase in their bee population. Funny thing about that, yeah. So, and we're just about to approve another neonicotinoid herbicide here in uh, America. And we've been having colony collapse here too as well. Yeah. Oh yeah. You know, I was actually talking to someone the other day and, uh, Somebody was talking about this in India, and then somebody brought up at the table that this is also going on in China, and uh, it's the women that are killing themselves. Hmm. You familiar with that, that at all? Hmm. Yeah, I meant to look that up a little bit. I was hoping you might know something about that. I, I, but then, you know, viewers out there may want to Google that. that it's, it's, it was the men in, in the India, but the women in China, hmm. just because of the different cultures. <laughs> right. But that's, you know, that's, that's terrible uh, that, that that is happening at all. I did hear something about China um, destroying three Monsanto shipments or something like that just in the last couple of days. I haven't had time to read it because I've been mm -hmm. extremely busy, but I mean, people <coughs> keep sending it to me, <laughs> and I mean to read it. Um, I don't really know what that's about. but Well, you're not going to see it on the news, so you're going to have to no. dig around I, on the I Internet. I don't watch regular news. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, and there, you know, there are these victories around the world where Hungary just just burned, and they have seen awesome photos of these fields of corn burning, and, and uh, Spain and France and all these other countries. They continually test shipments of grain, especially from the U.S., and many of them don't um, allow the import of GE grain. And so they find them, and if they can't actually ship them back to the U.S., they'll burn them. Um, in Sri Lanka, you know, all these different countries ban um, the importation and the selling of uh, GE foods. Japan doesn't like our stuff, Sri Lanka doesn't like it, tons of other countries don't like it. So really, the majority of uh, the food that we, the GE grains that we produce in the U.S. are fed to our own animals, mm -hmm. sheep, goats, pigs, cows. Um, so we're, we're constantly consuming it. And the reason is because they can't really export it to too many countries. There's a few countries that don't mind, right? But the majority of them don't. And like in uh, England and most of Europe, the campaigners there, the GE activists, have gotten uh, the companies to not, mostly the grocery stores, to not sell meat that was, that was fed genetically engineered grain. It might be legal to grow it in some of those countries, or to use it in some of those countries, but the public has said, we're not going to buy it. We're not going to buy so it. so these grocery stores looked at their bottom line, and if their customers aren't going to buy it, they're not going to sell it. They're not going to sell it. That's, yeah. that's the bottom line on that one. Yeah. Well, for, for all the different reasons, you know, Monsanto obviously isn't the only one, but it is the one that is the most, the most hated. And uh, so you Rightfully put together so. this. <laughs> Rightfully so. Well, they also <laughs> control, they, they dominate the, the seed industry. They have ninety percent of that. Mm-hmm. And so you put together a, r a rally and a march. You might speak a little bit about that. I know we have a graphic for it. We can put that up, and and people can uh, hopefully. Last time I I, said, I, I looked, it was four thousand three thousand six hundred thirty-two, and a couple hours later, it was forty-seven hundred people have signed on to the oh, Facebook that page. Any, yeah, I, was, I haven't got to check <laughs> in a while. Yeah, it's today. gone up quick. It's like doubled in the last few days. Now, whether or not they all go is another thing. But right. but uh, what exactly is going to happen at this at this rally in March? Well, at eleven a.m., um, we're going to have a rally for about an hour. It's going to start off with the Portland Raging Grannies. Um, all right. They're, they're going to sing some songs, and I think that's really rad. 
uh, after that, uh, I was supposed to speak, but I've got um, Daniel Shea for the Veterans for Peace, mm -hmm. who has his own personal story. Um, for Agent, I, I, from Agent Orange. Yeah, yeah that I, I, I felt was more important than anything I could possibly ever say. So he's going to speak, and then we've got Paul Sanfuegos, who's a community oh, yeah. rights activist. Um, after him, it's Scott Bates from GMO Free Oregon, and then Julia DeGraw from Food and Water Watch. Uh, Love Bomb Gogo -Go is going to lead off the march, and we'll march and meet back at the park approximately with an hour. We have uh, Bloco Alegria welcoming people back to the park. And... Uh, Oh, I can't remember the names of everybody after that, but we've got five more speakers. Uh, Andrew Still, who's a farmer and a seed producer, and uh, Andy Westland, who is a farmer. Um, we have someone with the Free Trade Organization, a couple other people. I'm sorry, I'm drawing a blank, but it's all on our website. Mm -hmm. And the website, we put that up. A few, hopefully we put it up. I haven't been looking at the, the monitor there, but your website was uh, M-A-M... H-T-T-P M-A-M P-D-X P-D-X, right. And we'll get that. There's, there's some of the other... Or, uh, these are some really good websites for folks wanna want to uh, get online and learn a little bit about what we've been talking about. Uh, they're very extensive websites, as is the Northwest Rage website. And so you say they're going to be somebody welcoming them back? Was that a band or something? Mm -hmm. so, yeah, like a samba well, so band. The one thing I was curious about is, is uh, this is taking place in uh, northeast Portland. Where, the, where is the march going to go to? Um, we're going to go up Multnomah to 16th, over to Weedler, back down to 6th, and then up Multnomah back to the park. and. Originally, of course, we thought of doing downtown because obviously that's your first thought. But um, Waterfront's taken with the Rose Festival, uh, so that was off limits. Pioneer Square, there's really nothing surrounding Pioneer Square that we're trying to protest. Um, I, as far as I'm concerned, the Lonsdale and the other park is off limits because they just spent all this money to Put, putting it back putting, together, putting it back together. Yes. so th that's gone and then there's a farmer's market at PSU that's kind of like preaching to the choir mm -hmm. um, the north northeast area is kind of um, uh, it, it doesn't have a lot of options for nutritional food you know there especially that area there's no health food store there's no New seasons. I mean, Whole Foods. You can go to Hollywood, but there's like the theater, the mall, with all the f the restaurants and the food court that are obviously selling GMO foods. Taco yeah. Bell, Safeway, oh, Burger yeah. King, McDonald's, and we were just like, okay, this park holds enough people, and then we're we might make an impact on people that are trying to ser serve their children a happy meal. They might be mm. like, what is this? hey, there's a band, maybe we should go check this out and, and yeah, learn something. I hope to learn something as well. Well, I think that's a very good idea. And and, uh, and the march, you know, I was wondering if you're going to march downtown, that'd be a long march for, for some <laughs> of the people that are going to be going. Well, but. it's a permitted event, and going across the bridge uh, requires more funding than we actually yeah, had available. That's a good so, point, yeah. Yeah. And talking about, like, these Happy Meals and whatnot, like, people should remember that Genetically engineered foods are kid tested, but not mom approved. <laughs> <laughs> the FDA does not actually require any safety testing. And in fact, it's all of us tested and none of us have approved of it. Mm -hmm. So what, gen so say just take, you know, McDonald's or any, any of the, any of the fast food, what genetically engineered foods would, would they be serving? Oh boy, <laughs> <laughs> we don't have enough time. Right, <laughs> the, the meat was fed GE corn. The, the cows were fed GE corn. There's of course lots of antibiotics that the cows are fed as well. Um, basically, any anything soy. I mean, unless you know that you're getting certified organic soy, soy is a GMO crop. Mm -hmm. uh, corn, corn's a big one. Canola oil, those are things you have to look out for. I mean, I 
I remember in the 90s, soy was deemed the, the superfood and that you should eat yeah. it. And I was eating tons of it. And now it's like I try to avoid it unless I know it, where it came from. Well, and since it's, they mix it all together, it's really difficult to know. Yeah. At least that's what I understand. They mix this, uh, the genetically engineered with the non-genetically engineered, unless it's specifically held out, like you say, then, then you're, you're getting it. Well, basically then, you know, because don't they use corn and, and soy for fillers in a lot of the foods? Mm -hmm. And they make, the, the other unfortunate aspect that's slightly hidden for a lot of people is almost all vitamin C is genetically engineered. There's only about four different companies in America that, that actually produce the mass quantities of vitamin C. I've never heard that. And you can make vitamin C out of plants. And so the soybeans, the canola, and the corn, and a lot of other vitamins, um, any of your soy protein isolates, any of your whey powders, not the whey powders, well, the whey with RBGH milk. Um, so a lot of your vitamins, even though it might be a really cool company, they're all sourcing. There's just only so many of the huge manufacturers of vitamin B or vitamin A or D and whatnot. And they all get different labels when they ship them to somebody and they put on or put in their other ingredients and have their label. So a lot of your vitamins are engineered as well. It's totally new to me and I'm, yeah. I'll bet it's new to a lot of the viewers as well. I always picture vitamin C rose hips or something. Well, it should be made out of rose yeah. hips, organically grown rose <laughs> yeah. hips. You get the flower, you get the smell, and then you get the Can't vitamin C. Can't you just eat your roses? Well, you can as well. You can eat your roses. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Yeah. You well, can you eat your dandelions, too. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, except unless they've been sprayed. Right. So... Well, no, we've talked a lot about the, the Frank and salmon and, and uh, all the different uh, you know food stuffs that the that they have these genetically uh, uh, whatever they are put in them. I know they tried to put a fish in a tomato a while back or something like that as one of the first ones. But uh, I know that you were on the programs in the past, and, and and one of the major things that you would want to talk about was uh, Franken trees and and grasses. And this is like one of the grass capitals of the world, yeah. growing seed and and I guess it's mostly seed, but they do grow sod. Now, the issues with that, I would think, would be uh, you know adulterating the crops around that. And is is that still is that is that been stopped or is that still going on? Uh, unfortunately, the genetically engineered bent grass, which was designed to be resistant to Roundup, and then designed to be sold to golf courses, so that they could just spray Roundup and not have any weeds in their in their greens and and teas, um, that had a field trial in Madras, Oregon, uh, a number of years ago, and the seed and the pollen from that field trial contaminated Eastern Oregon and it is still to this day spreading and contaminating another there's 12 different species of bent grass and other grasses out there that can cross pollinate with it and so it is continuing to contaminate they're still finding um, areas along ditches and all over the the grasslands and farmers fields whatnot where they're still having this uh, contaminated uh, bent grass so that is just spreading that would take a massive cleanup um, they've cleaned up some of it but it, it's basically out it's done. Mm -hmm. And the other issue is GE trees and ArborGen, um, the uh, massive uh, uh, GE tree company, has done a whole number of field trials and freeze tolerant eucalyptus, so it's cold tolerant. So it can be grown in areas, you know, it's usually from really hotter climates, Australia, Australia and whatnot. Yeah. And so they want to grow it in the US to make paper, toilet paper, all these different things. Biomass is a huge aspect of it. You're going to have a fast-growing, freeze-tolerant tree that can grow all year round, whereas yeah. in other areas would only it would shut down during winter. Isn't that like poplar? Don't they use that too as well? Exactly. Yeah. And they've done all these field trials. They let a bunch of these field trials actually flower, so who knows how much cross-contamination there is already. Um, we don't grow a lot of eucalyptus in here, but there's a lot of landscape species of eucalyptus out there. And ArborGen is... Uh, has petitioned the uh, USDA to allow deregulation and allow them to grow millions and millions of these freeze-tolerant um, transgenic eucalyptus trees in the in the South, in seven different states in the South. And starting today, there is a protest uh, against a biotech tree conference. And so there's going to be who knows what all is going to happen, but some really you know kick-ass people are down there and they're going to have some protests and probably some arrests. No, it's down in um, uh, North Carolina or South Carolina. And uh, it's going to last until uh, June 3rd. 
And so they, people, if you want to check that out, can go to stopgetrees.org. And the problem with this is they suck up lots of water. They're extremely flammable. Uh, people in uh, South America and Latin America who have uh, plantations of GE trees call, call them the green desert because they suck up all the water, their wells run dry, their rivers run dry, etc. Uh, they're extremely flammable, they do cross-contaminate with other species, and you can cut them down, but they re-sprout. So even if they, you know, the industry says, well, we're clear-cutting them, obviously, to make this paper, there's still, you know, what if a farmer goes out of business and there's all these stumps, they will re-sprout and continue to contaminate the environment. So they're basically deciduous then? Yeah. yeah. Well, yeah. I know the said there's a lot of them around San Francisco. Yeah. yeah. And that's that doesn't get really cold there. Yeah. So they, they probably thrive there because of it. Yeah, and they you know, they deregulated a GE plum a few years ago and that actually hasn't been grown. Nobody's actually decided to to grow it because it's really the disease that they uh, uh, plum spot virus, I think isn't a big deal in the U.S. So they actually did deregulate. Uh, the eucalyptus will be the second tree if it actually gets deregulated. We'll have a lawsuit against it as well on that. And then Okanagan Specialty Fruits up in uh, <coughs> British Columbia is also now petitioning Canada and the U.S. to deregulate or commercialize a non-browning apple. You know mm -hmm. how bad it is when so you slice that apple mm -hmm. and it sits out there so for 10 just, minutes and it turns a little brown. It's just cosmetic. Yeah. Right. <laughs> mm -hmm. And thankfully, the Canadian farmers, and especially Washington State, you know, a huge apple state, uh, they've all said, we don't want it. So it's, it's in the regulatory process, or the deregulatory process, <coughs> and public opinion is against it. Simplot, another new product that might, um, is in the pipeline, you know, we, we stop GE potatoes. Mostly because, um, well, there's obviously a lot of public activism against it, but uh, McDonald's, the potato that they made uh, didn't, uh, I think it was called the New Leaf Potato, didn't hold up to McDonald's standards for <laughs> oh, gold and french fries and all that. <laughs> and well, they were the, one, the, the biggest potato purchaser in the world. Right. People like their french fries. Right. And so Simplot, which is one of the largest growers, if not the largest grower of potatoes in the world, grows a lot of land in, in Idaho and in so southeast Oregon, they have their own laboratories and they are coming out with or have come out with a potato called innate and they're using genes from within the potato species not transgenic not different species of plants or animals um, and this potato won't have those black spots or won't bruise which is a problem when you ship mm -hmm. so, so that's that not on the market yet more like a, a crossbreeding type well thing? it is genetic engineering because they're doing it in the laboratory right. but it's not transgenic and a lot of these you know, crops that are out there are transgenic, so two different species of things to make a product. Genetic engineering, no matter what, is bad. Like, we just shouldn't need this stuff. Uh, it's a solution in search of a problem. We don't need, um, you know, we need to uh, change our agro, um, our agricultural processes and our systems, get a lot more small farms, a lot more local, a lot more organic. For any reason that the industry gives that uh, we supposedly need this technology, we've already got a sustainable method that in some cases we've been using for 12,000 years um, to do the same exact thing, just like golden rice. I was gonna bring that up next that you read my There's line. five varieties of rice on the planet already that they've found, there could possibly be lots more, that produce vitamin A. And the golden rice only produces beta carotene. So when you eat the golden rice, you have to also have oil and fat in your diet to produce, or to make it turn into vitamin A in your body. We already have five varieties of rice that produce vitamin A. So it's a billion dollar boondoggle. It's like two billion dollar boondoggle already. They've been trying this for 15 years. Still not on the market. They're doing field trials in the Philippines. Most of the Asian um, folks that they've done, uh, whatever you call those tests where they give your product, they're like, well, who pissed on the rice? Because it's yellow. <laughs> and they eat white rice and brown rice and red rice. There isn't any yellow rice. So they think that the rice is contaminated and they don't want to eat it anyway. Mm -hmm. Much less to get the recommended daily allowance of <laughs> vitamin A from eating this golden rice, you have to have fat and diet and, and, and protein. And that comes from people who can afford it. 
and a lot of these people can't. Mm -hmm. I understand that a lot of these genetically engineered products and things that have come out, they they uh, they say that it's going to feed the masses, and you know it, it doubles your your uh, your yields in the first year, but by the fifth year, it's half as much. I don't remember why, but I remember that 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 is causing problems, and it's you know people losing their lands because their yields are going down. <coughs> well, and part of that is. The industry claimed all this stuff. We're going to feed the world. However, they didn't make any of these GE crops produce more food. They made them resistant to herbicides or produce their own pesticide in every cell of the plant. They didn't increase any nutrition. They didn't make it more healthful. Um, they are trying to come out with some omega-3 uh, products that are higher in omega-3 and less in other things. But the industry never started out that way, and they're 99% of it is still resistance to an herbicide or having a pesticide inserted into the plant, you know, 24 hours a day. And the yields are decreasing because you're getting these resistant weeds. Oh, okay. So not only are, not only did the FDA allow... And bugs. Yeah. So not only did the FDA allow an increase in residual levels of uh, Roundup on our food, because we spray it so much, or these farmers spray it so much now that the plants are resistant to it. But now we have all these species of weeds that are resistant to the Roundup, so they're also spraying dicamba or all sorts of other um, herbicides mm -hmm. to deal with this added problem. So this genetic engineering is actually adding problems for these farmers and not, not really helping them at all. Mm -hmm. Well, in the monoculture, mono, mono, yeah, monoculture, excuse me, sorry, a system of growing things depletes the nutrients from the ground. You're just supposed to rotate your crops and grow things next to each other to, to keep the pests down. And when you're growing one crop in a huge area mm -hmm. year after year after year, as well as adding pesticides to it, you're just depleting the natural resources that are, sure. are there anyway. That's kind of what led to the Dust Bowl, right. that, whole, that whole thing. Well, you know, what, one of the things that I've got against Monsanto isn't, isn't, isn't what they're doing with genetic engineering, although that's a big issue. It's how they conduct themselves. Uh, they have discouraged and persecuted people who were writing articles and books and, and stopped these things from happening. And there was a fellow named, uh, I think in Canada, named Percy. Schmeiser, yeah. yeah. You know, are you familiar with that story? Yeah. yeah. He was growing canola and there canola blows in the wind and it came into his crop and then they decided to sue him and basically took everything he had. So he was growing non-genetically mm -hmm. engineered and they sued him for stealing the genetic engineer. It was something... Patent infringement. Patent infringement, even though that, that, that it was their fault. He did fault not for, grow their yeah, stuff. Yeah, it blew into right. his and, you know, it was, it was things like that that I think... Uh, it, you know, aside from the fact that what they're polluting the planet, you know, their their predatory practices is 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 just to me just you know, terrible. Uh, that was the one that stuck out the most, but uh, there's been others as well. And I, I can't think of any offhand. I don't remember the people's names, but there was a book that was stopped. Yeah, well, I, I think he happens to be the one that's most highly publicized. I mean, I see him in almost every documentary I watch. Mm -hmm. But recently, there was an Indiana farmer that uh, bought some seeds from a local seller that happened to have second-generation Monsanto seeds in it, and he didn't even know. I mean, they weren't labeled Monsanto, and I'm not exactly sure how Monsanto found out, but they've sued this guy for, like, $84,000. And... From seeds he bought on the from market. From seeds he bought on the market, yeah. <coughs> well, he was a smart farmer. He went to a silo and he decided to get some seed that, you know, all these people had, had sent it to the to the grain silo. And he was going to do another crop of uh, you know, soybeans. Yes, he was a um, soybean farmer. And uh, so he bought it much cheaper from the silo, planted it, and it did happen to be Roundup Ready soybeans. And he fought it. He took it to court. Monsanto, you know, sued him, and he took it to court, and it was a Supreme Court decision that just came out. And even though it's, they, they call it second generation because the original farmer who grew those soybeans had to sign this contract, do all these things to legally, you know, grow this GE crop. 
but then it's then he's done and he ships it to the silo. He has nothing else to do with it. And the silo, of course, you know, ships it into the feed lot or feed market or whatever. And so this guy was pretty smart. He's like, I'll get some cheaper seed and, and plant it. Well, Monsanto found out about it and the Supreme Court said that their patent protection basically extends forever. So even though it should have been quote off patent because this original farmer did his you know legal rights and legal mm -hmm. duties and then sold it and that should have been the end of that patent protection for Monsanto now the Supreme Court has yet again uh, ruled in favor of Monsanto and their patent protection seems like from this case just kind of goes on and on and on they can sue anybody mm-hmm well there's there's um, I'm thinking maybe it was Hillary Clinton that was a lawyer for Monsanto. Yeah, at one she worked time. for the Rose Law Firm that represented Monsanto. Right, so they know they've, uh, you know the story better than I, but I know that Monsanto had, there's been people who's worked for Monsanto that has gone to work for the government, wrote legislation favoring Monsanto, and then once it was passed, they got back out. Do I have that right? Still happening to this Still day. Happening. The head of the <laughs> FDA is an ex Monsanto yeah. executive. His name's Michael Taylor. Mm -hmm. He's also the one that was responsible for the bovine growth hormone in the milk. Which nobody in the world wants. <laughs> right. Yeah. But, yeah. It's, thankfully, it's now down to about 10%. You know, it used to be about 30% of the cows in the U.S. And, and Monsanto, smart business decision, they realized that people didn't want BGH. And they sold off their, uh, their, their Pozilac, is what it's called technically, division to another company. And now it's only down to about 10%. So we're slowly winning on, on that. It's yeah. a... It's a you know, if it is all food that we're eating. For some reason, milk is a little more gets people in the gut, or mothers in the gut, and like they're feeding it to the kids. Yeah, so I think a lot of people are going for organic to do or non-BGH non milk. Well, I've given a couple. There's some good websites right there. I mean, there's uh, some good uh, information about what's going on tomorrow, and uh, we'll, we'll leave that up while we're talking about this a little bit. We got less than two minutes left. Do uh, you want to talk just real briefly about that again? We're running out of time here. Be there at 11 a.m. Um, and let's make our voices be heard. I mean, this is a fight that we all need to come together th and and basically destroy this company. I, I don't I don't know if that was the per correct words to use, but uh, <laughs> yeah, we we have to, to come start. together. Be there. Bring your friends. Bring your family. It's a family friendly event. All right. And I was putzing around on the internet and I found a two, two really good videos. The World According to Monsanto, which is not a pro Monsanto. <laughs> <laughs> it's an hour and 50 minutes long. It's quite long, but it's, it's a regular documentary. Yeah. And then Seeds of Death, Dis uh, seeds Unraveling of the Lies of GMOs. Oh. And those are some, some good videos if you want to check those out. Seeds of Death, Unraveling. That's, that's what the word is, is, the lies of GMOs and the world according to Monsanto. Some really good uh, videos, and we've had some graphics up, uh, northwestrage.org and uh, a couple others through the program. We're down to about 37 minutes. Thank you both for coming on. Yeah. I mean, you know, we could have gone a lot of different directions <laughs> with this, but we, we covered quite a bit of it, and uh, maybe we'll, uh, we'll, do, we'll do this again in the future. I yeah. want to thank folks for tuning in. Uh, and I hope you got something out of this and we'll continue and come on down tomorrow and learn a little bit more. What Tiffany was saying, we've got some really good, she's got some really good speakers and there's going to be some good knowledge floating around. And Idle No More at 10 o'clock. Oh, I yes. forgot that. Idle No More at 10 o'clock. That'll be Idle No More uh, Drumming and Round Dance at 10 o'clock. So thanks for tuning in. I want to thank the crew. We'll see you next week.